Hops. There it is. Woo! All right. I could not be more excited to be here to support my man here and some great coaches who are really passing on their knowledge to you. And so what I'm up to now is called the off-ball athlete. Josh alluded to it, but really thinking about it in volleyball, you only have the ball 1% of the time in volleyball. Really quick contact, set, super quick contact, spike or block, super quick contact. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. Can you impact the outcome of the game when you do not have the ball? Yes. So, this is incredible. We are focusing on the on-ball skills, on everything that you're doing. But even when you're on the court, there's an opportunity to prepare your movement, be in the right place. The mental side that Josh alluded to, all of that is so important. So, if you're waiting for the ball in sport, or if you're waiting for the ball in life, and you're sitting there waiting, you know, I'm just gonna wait for the ball to be in my possession to put in the work, to then start preparing versus, okay, I don't have the ball in sport or in life. I'm going to work on building myself so that when the ball comes, it's then preparation meets opportunity. Does that make sense? I want this to be interactive. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So there's a couple of things that come to mind within that video that, that's so fun. The first thing is, and this is not about tooting my own horn, but I led the league, or not league, sorry, the Olympics and aces up until the quarterfinals. I'm not the best server in the world. That being said, we worked so hard on controlling the things that were in our control so that when the Olympics came, we were able to make full advantage or take full advantage of our opportunities. When you're holding the ball to serve, you're depending on no one else but yourself. If you're waiting for a spike, you're probably waiting on your partner, you're waiting on a perfect pass, you're waiting on the perfect set, there's the wind, there's other things, there's the opponents, okay? Those are things that are outside of your control. But when you're serving, it is you and the ball, the whistle blows, and you have 100% opportunity to capitalize on it. So we prepared on those moments to be able to succeed at the Olympic Games. So that was one thing that we worked on that you guys can absolutely work on in your game, which is service because that is 100% in your control. Other concepts that I just want to play off of that video because it was so good. I still have the goosebumps thinking about it and seeing it. But I talk about the Olympics as he who poops their pants the least wins. If you come out of the game with the least amount of poo in your pants, you win. So I get Because everyone's pooing their pants. Who does not what I'm saying with that, it's a silly way of saying, we're all nervous. Josh alluded to when we were in the tunnel, we're all just so like, oh my gosh. We're all in it together. There's no one that's immune to it. There's no one that is perfectly prepared and is better than everybody else in that moment. We're all in it together, okay? So the pressures, the people, the intensity, the amount of people that are watching online, in the stands, the sporting staff, all the money that's gone in, all the time that's gone in, all of that stuff creates this internal pressure that you have to deal with. And likely you're gonna pull your pants a little bit. But if you're able to control that, if you're able to not lock that up into a box and, and try to hide from it, if you're able to, okay, I'm okay with that. I know that's there. I'm going to play with that, right? Josh said, harness it. That fear instinct, that pressure instinct isn't something that you need to lock away and put somewhere because you're afraid of it. It's a natural, call it a resource. It's there for you. It's a survival mechanism, that fear. That fear isn't a bad thing. You can learn to use it. And, and my conversation around that tunnel revolves around, I gave myself permission to compete at the Olympics. And that permission happened when Josh and I were standing beside each other in that tunnel, 12,000 people going nuts. We could barely he hear each other. I could feel the energy of the stadium in my lungs. My lungs were vibrating. It was so loud. And our opponents are right there. Josh is beside me, and I'm starting to poo my pants a little bit. And in that moment, I flashed back step by step through my life in a second when I was nine years old when I started to play volleyball. As I progressed, Team BC, because I'm from the West Coast, Team Canada, 
all the way through. Then Josh and I had some incredible games to then earn the berth for the Olympics. All of that happened because we earned the right to be there. We had gone through the steps and we had captured that for ourselves. So there was nobody else in Canada that deserved to be in that moment other than us. And in that moment, in realizing that, I gave myself permission to be there. We had a nice little hug and we went out and we played the best that we could. But we owned that moment as much as we possibly could based on the preparation and based on us going through the passageway. Two that comes up, and this guy, he's a great partner. He sets the highest bar out there. I wanna to talk to you about gratitude and accountability. I've never played with a beach volleyball partner like Josh in my life. Other beach volleyball partners, oh no, it's fine, it's fine, we'll get it next time. Oh no, it's all good, it's all good. Oh my bad, my bad, my bad. With Josh, there's no such thing as, I'll get it next time, or my bad. It was either great work, or is why it didn't happen. I was on the hook 100% of the time, not in a bad way, but there was a, an accountability that was there. But on the flip side of accountability, there was a gratitude and a love that was there. If we succeeded, if we won the point and we did what was good, there was the gratitude, there was an appreciation, there was a confirmation that what we did was right. But on the flip side, if we didn't block line and dig cross and then one of us faltered, there was an immediate come together of why didn't that work? I need to do better. That was my assignment because if I'm trying to do 100% of things over here and he's trying to do 100% of things over here, we're not a team. And so the gratitude and accountability piece with your teammate is so critical. Too much accountability, you're in a dictatorship. Too much gratitude and you're in a yoga class. Okay, so you can't have too much of one and too much of the other. There needs to be a one-to-one -one ratio. And it's not personal. It's not personal. When someone's trying to hold you accountable for your position, don't take it personally. That little ping, that little, uh, that resistance, oh, I don't want that. And then you take it personally and throw it on them. You know, that's that blame game. That's when you're not cohesive with your partner. So accountability and gratitude. Does that show up for you at all? Yeah, and I love that you mentioned that because <clears throat> that uh, echoes some of our camp objectives, right? Like gratitude, being grateful, positive, and the accountability. Part. I don't even know if you saw that, but it's, it's great that you mentioned it. And just so you guys kind of have perspective, it's not about executing, and if you miss the hit, you're like, what happened there? It's about process. Like, I think a lot of us, especially in, like, I don't know, our Western side, we can focus on the outcome and result versus the process of just doing the right things. And whether it happens or not uh, is kind of irrelevant. Like, you know, that one cut shot, he hit the net, trying the right thing, that shot was there, versus did you make a bad decision? Was he waiting there? You know what I mean? So when you guys are playing with each other, um, and you make an error, try to think about, was it a good error, process, or uh, process error, so you had the right shot, you saw it open, you just missed it, or was it a bad choice, is it set way off the net, and instead of you trying to like make a good play, you just blast and it goes way out the back, and that's not a good choice, right? So the errors we're talking about, um, that's the kind of key that we have. So building on top of the gratitude and accountability, how can we do that? And so this is something I call standards versus expectations. Expectations is what you have inside of yourself that you expect that other person, person to do, but you didn't tell them. My expectation of you is to do this, but I didn't tell you to do that. And then if you don't do it, I'm mad at you. Does that make sense? No. So an expectation is a standard that is poorly articulated or poorly communicated or not even communicated at all. So one of the strengths that Josh and I had was that we worked hard early, and I wanna say we worked harder than anybody else at communicating. We had no expectations because everything was communicated properly, therefore it was a standard. Our team had standards. So we held each other accountable, but there was a clear standard of execution that every time we came to practice, every time we prepared for the game, every time we played a game, I knew what was going on. I knew the partnership, I knew the standard. But if you're not communicating properly, or if you think, yeah, don't worry, we'll deal with that later, that's gonna come back and bite you in the butt when it really matters down the road. So for instance, I'm working with Julie Gordon and, and Sophie Bukovic a little bit, and they're Canada's number four team right now for women 
great team that's coming up and, and they're working together on a new partnership. And so there was a moment last week where there was an opportunity to have a dialogue, to have a discussion, to talk about something that happened. And they just kind of went, ah, no, it's okay, it was fine. No, I meant to say that, but you meant it this way. And I understood this, but you know, we'll deal with it later. I stepped onto the court, grabbed them both by the shoulder and said, no, we're dealing with this right now. This tiny little thing where you think that you're saying this and you think that she's interpreting it this way and then vice versa is an expectation that's clearly not working. And so we, in that moment, spoke a little bit more, we took the time, we made it a standard and we left. And now they have a standard for their team that this, mean, this word means this, and there's no confusion. Something as tiny as that to build a world-class team is critical. And that's what Josh and I spent a lot of time doing, was making sure that everything was just totally clear to both of us, and it made it so easy because we weren't thinking about how to communicate with each other when we were in London because there's no space, there's no time to think about communicating. It had to be natural. Does that make sense? Yeah, and don't be uh, apprehensive to have those maybe difficult conversations because there's a fine line between you don't want to be blaming, but you also don't want to not say anything. Totally. And in practice, that's the time to you know, have those conversations. To the point, some people didn't want to practice with us because they spent so much time in between points communicating, but we didn't care. We held that high standard. We knew it was going to benefit us in the end. And the no one that didn't you know, respect it saw that those that see, saw how well it worked out, they kind of started mimicking the lifestyle. So communication, yeah, super important. So I'll take five more minutes. Is that cool? Have I go five more minutes, Deering? Is that cool, Vince? Okay. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the mental side, the game within the game stuff that Josh is, in, in my opinion, one of the best in the world at. So mental strength is critical as an athlete. Now mental strength is not putting yourself into a box with really strong, thick walls, and then you're sitting in there and you're protected from the world. That's not what mental strength is. Mental strength is having a really nice framework that's strong that you're inside and you're in a situation and you're fluid in that situation. So if a moment happens where, for instance, I cut shot into the net, I had to be fluid in that. I needed to assess what that was and I had to let it go and then move into the next one. And I hit the next ball because I didn't bring my failure of my last point into the next point with me. And so that mental strength is not being how hard am I? Because the walls, when you build those hard walls, they go in inner and you get smaller and smaller. You want to be fluid and be able to take what happened, let it go and replace it with a positive thought. And that's what I did in that situation. So as an extension of that, my self-concept, my belief in myself had to be unwavering. And so I like to say you can never outperform your self-concept. You can never do better than how highly you think of yourself. If you think that you're absolutely terrible and the voice inside of your head confirms that every single second of your life, you don't really have an opportunity to, to perform above that regardless of how talented you are. But you need to work on the dialogue inside of your head and build up your self-concept so that preparation once again meets opportunity. So your positive words inside of your head is so important. What you believe that you're capable of doing is so, so important. And our team, we came together in 2012. So we were competing against teams that had played together for six years, possibly 10 years. I think we might have been the, the earliest partnership in the Olympics. So we had to build that identity as a team and that self-concept of the team. And if we didn't believe in each other, there's no way that we would have made it to the Olympics. So I, I don't know if that shows up for you in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. And that positive self-talk, again, goes back to what we talked about with the objectives. It's so important. And I, I remember hearing, I was like, oh, what's that going to do to tell myself how great I am? But like, I actually realized how powerful it is. So we can't stress enough. And it's amazing. We didn't even talk about what he was going to talk about before this. So it's not like I'm saying, hey, make sure you talk about the objectives. Um, you know, to hear him say that uniquely, it's so important, guys. And like, you don't have to tell anybody you're doing. Just do it. It's inner dialogue. And it's like self-affirmation, if you want to Google the science behind it, and it shows that uh, shows up in your brain waves and stuff. But uh, positive uh, affirmations, talking about uh, how great you are, how great you can be, uh, it's super important, even though it sounds kind of uh, cheesy, it's, it's so profound. 
And then one super quick exercise that will bring you to realize that time is a really important resource. We have 24 hours in a day. I hope we're sleeping for eight hours, so let's take eight hours off of that, so 16. If you're not getting eight hours of sleep, you seriously need to reevaluate your life. Because sleep, especially at your age, is critical to your growth and development. If you're not sleeping, don't even worry about being a high-performance athlete. Now that we got that straightened out, we're at 16 hours a day. Who here goes to school? Perfect, we're gonna take eight hours off the table. So we got eight hours left in our day. Who here likes to eat the foodies? I love eating. Yeah, food usually takes me about three hours of eating and preparation throughout the day. So eight minus three, we're at five. Who here likes to hang with the homies and homets? Yeah, wow, you guys, come on, we're social here. Well, <laughs> let, let's do an hour and a half to two hours for the sake of math, let's do two. So we're at five, we're gonna minus two, we're at three hours left. Who here likes to use some time to do homework, let's just say. We have to do homework, right? Yeah, homework. Oh no, okay. We'll, we'll talk about that later, my man. An hour and a half off the table. Three hours brings us down to an hour and a half. You have an hour and a half every single day to work on yourself. Is that a lot of time? No. So if you mindlessly <clears throat> look into your computer screen or your cell phone, check out Instagram, and just float away, you are losing valuable time to work on yourself. So protect that hour and a half that you have to work on yourself with your life. That hour and a half every single day is so important. If you don't guard that time, that resource, you're gonna miss incredibly important opportunities for you to become the best athlete you can possibly be. Does that make sense? Yes. Beautiful. All right, thanks Martin, I appreciate yep. that. I know there's a lot of, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, I know that was a lot of information to take in, but just kind of uh, let it absorb. Hopefully it resonates with you guys when you leave here and really uh, you know, take in what you got because he's got some uh, amazing special information um, and we were lucky that he was able to come today. So uh, I'm not sure if he's gonna be able to stick around, but if not, just thank him on your way out and uh, we're gonna keep going here. Have fun! Woo! This must be fun too! Okay.